the Great Armada begins its ponderous move into the Channel waters. The men who will actually be the first into France are still back on English soil. Paratroopers of the U.S. 82nd and 101st Airborne Divisions and the British 6th Airborne Division are to jump behind enemy lines to secure the flanks of the invasion area. On the eve of the invasion, the Supreme Commander visits some of them. I found them in fine fettle General Eisenhower is to write later, admonishing me that I had nothing to worry about. Theirs is to be the biggest airborne invasion ever attempted to this time. The crucial hours of darkness ahead will make almost superhuman demands on them. Bad weather and anti-aircraft fire will scatter many of them over a much wider distance than is planned. They will be forced to fight the enemy as they find him in the night, in small groups and on unfamiliar terrain. But dawn will find the flanks at either end of the Normandy battlefield held by these first invaders. None of this, of course, can they know as they board their planes in the late hours before D-Day. from its British bases. The carriers were the airborne warriors. The gliders carrying weapons and heavy communications equipment. Night skies over Normandy are suddenly alive with the dark shapes of men who will bring the first fires of D-Day to fortress Europe. In the waters of the English Channel, dawn lights up the invasion fleet plowing steadily toward the Normandy coast. With almost 5,000 seagoing vessels, the historic armada is the greatest ever assembled. An hour before the first troops are scheduled to hit the shore, a naval bombardment opens up on the enemy's coastal defenses. are at first confused about the Allied invasion. They are not aware a full-scale assault is in the making.
Allied air forces, which have been protecting the assault convoy throughout its trip, join the attack on enemy targets. In wave after wave, they roar overhead, above the armada. In the ships of the invasion fleet, the men can hear the steady pounding of their fire on the enemy's positions. And they wonder, hopefully, if anything can be left alive on shore. and fear and tension. The trip to the beaches begins. At the spear tip of this historic seaborne attack are some 3,000 men, American, British, and Canadian troops, who will hit in the first wave. Behind them, the main body of ground forces will land in succeeding waves. Beaches called Utah and Omaha, and Sword and Gold and Juno, they come ashore. On the murderous sands of Normandy and its rim of watery hell, they push against the gates of Fortress Europe and the fates of war and freedom await their performance. Enemy resistance varies in degree from beach to beach. But for every man there, the new world of Normandy is a world of private agony and chaos. And no man can see the broad design beyond it, on a scale so epic that words written long ago by William Shakespeare could have been composed for the 6th of June, 1944. He that outlives this day and comes safe home will stand a tiptoe when this day is named. Three hours after the invasion begins, it is clear that the Allies have their foothold, however precarious. The electrifying announcement is made in London. It is night across the United States. Swing shift workers in war plants are the first to hear the news. Under the command of General Eisenhower, Allied naval forces, supported by strong air forces, began landing Allied armies this morning on the northern coast of France, unquote. This is the only word we have at this time. 
There is no indication yet of exactly where the invasion took place or how many men were involved. The price paid this day for the Allied hold on the beaches of Normandy is not cheap. But although the cost is steep, the results are incalculable to the plan of battle. The beachhead soon expands from foothold to lodgment. Men and weapons and equipment pour ashore. Within 12 days, almost 600,000 men and 90,000 vehicles are on the beaches, massed for the drive inland. Ten months of war still lie ahead in Europe. Bitter fighting through the hedgerow country of the lodgement area. Hard grinding combat in the cities that lead from Normandy to the banks of the Elbe. Many men yet will fall. Many reverses will be suffered. Many triumphs recorded. But in the main, the progress of battle will follow the bold plan conceived in Allied councils and brought to flaming life by the men who stormed the Normandy beaches on a day which will forever be known as D-Day, who unlocked the gates of Fortress Europe so that a monstrous evil could be pursued and destroyed.